good to open the Word of God with you again, and our study uh, today is from John's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 19, and this first chapter is a remarkable overview of the history of time, and in fact goes before time uh, to a beginning before the beginning of time, space, and matter. And so we rapidly move in chapter one from the one who was there before the world began, who made the worlds and through whom all the world consists. And then we travel rapidly through the Old Testament. We're introduced to Moses and how the law came through Moses. And then we come to the forerunner of the Messiah. And that's where we begin our study in chapter one in verse 19 we read this is the testimony of John and they begin to ask John certain questions um, are you the Messiah in verse uh, 20 and then are you Elijah in verse 21 and then are you the prophet now these were three strands of prophetic word uh, regarding the Messiah of course many many verses that promise the Messiah and John answers that he's not the Messiah. And then they ask, are you Elijah? And uh, this was a promise that the Lord had given uh, to the nation of Israel. We read about it in uh, Malachi, uh, the last chapter. In fact, the last time God speaks to man until John appears, uh, that he would promise them Elijah. Now, there seems to be a contradiction because John says he's not Elijah. And the Lord Jesus says, if only you knew, he is that Elijah. And this was a great idea that, that captivated the Jewish nation. And they kept asking that question. They asked Jesus, are you Elijah? And in fact, when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, they said he's calling for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah comes. And to this day, when a Jewish family has the Passover, uh, they will call for Elijah. They'll have an extra seat at the table and they'll go, the children will go and look down the hallway or look outside to see if Elijah is coming because Messiah will not come until Elijah comes. But what John was doing was taking the humble place and saying, no, no, I don't really qualify to be in this uh, rarefied atmosphere of the great prophet Elijah. But the Lord Jesus was explaining that John came in the spirit of Elijah when he came to announce the coming of the Messiah. And then they ask, are you the prophet? And this, of course, takes us back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, where Moses said that God would raise up a prophet like me. And, uh, of course, the Lord Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. And in that sense, he actually is the prophet. So John says, no, I'm not that prophet. And then they say, who are you? And John quotes this passage from Isaiah 40 and says, I'm a voice, not even a mouth, just a voice crying in the wilderness. In other words, don't look at me, but listen to what I'm saying. Make straight the way of the Lord. And the idea is I've come before uh, and my call is to fill in the potholes and smooth out the bumps and prepare the royal mile for the coming of the Messiah. And so we read in verse uh, 30, uh, verse 24, now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, if you're not Elijah, and if you're not the prophet? And John doesn't immediately answer the question, but he does answer it in verse 31, when he says, John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, verse 33, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. And in verse 31, he says, uh, I didn't know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. So he explains that the reason, the big reason he was baptizing 
uh, was bigger than simply calling Israel to repent and prepare for the coming of Messiah, but that through the baptism of the Lord Jesus and the descent of the Holy Spirit and the voice of God from heaven, uh, the nation of Israel would know for sure who the Messiah really was. And so John says, that's really the big reason I was baptizing, not just to call Israel to repentance and prepare for the Messiah, but that through him, through this baptism of Jesus, uh, I would know as his forerunner, and eventually the nation of Israel would know that this actually is the Messiah. Now, in verse 27, uh, the, the apostle, uh, the uh, John the baptizer says, uh, it is he who coming after me is prepared, preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. So the only reason you'd want to loose some sandal strap would be to wash their feet. And John is saying, I don't even deserve to wash the feet of this person. And you see here that he says he was preferred before me. And later on, he says, because he was before me. And so here we have this marvel of the incarnation that though Jesus historically came after John, he actually existed before John because he is the incarnate God. And, and here we read in verse uh, 33, John says, I didn't know him. But then it was manifested uh, by the descent of the Holy Spirit. And this is a beautiful picture here. We have really a reference back to the story of Noah and the flood and how the dove uh, had no clean place to land. And so it returned to the ark. But when the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove, there was one clean place to land. And that was on the head of the sinless son of God. And so uh, he says in verse 34, I have seen and testified that this is the son of God. Now there are a whole series of statements here regarding this word to see, behold the lamb of God. This is the a second person singular imperative of the word to see where we read, come and see, come and see several times in the passage. And John says, I have seen. And so, um, John, the uh, apostle who's writing this book, is called John the Seer. And of course, uh, in writing the Revelation, that's what it's all about, is seeing the Lord. So the first time John the Baptist says in this passage, behold the Lamb of God, uh, in verse 29, he adds, who takes away the sin of the world? The great need of the human race is to see the Lord Jesus as the Lamb of God, to behold him dying for us. But that's not the end of our seeing. He goes on to say in verse 36, behold the Lamb of God. And in fact, the Christian life is simply one of going on to see him. We're not changed by looking at ourselves, says Paul, but beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we're changed into his image. And this is the whole spirit of Christianity is beholding the Lord Jesus, looking at him. And so we lift him up to the lost and say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But we lift him up to the believer, too, and say, keep looking at him. Keep your eye on him. This is the secret of transformation as we behold the Lamb of God. And so in verses 19 uh, through 28, we're introduced to the forerunner, John the Baptist, and he says, I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. And then in verses 29 to 34, we're introduced to the Messiah as the Lamb of God. Well, then in verses 35 and down to the end, we're introduced to the followers of Jesus, to the disciples. And uh, when John says, behold the Lamb of God, two disciples who are disciples of John say, um, we, we need to go and find out about this person. And so they follow Jesus. And Jesus turns to them and says, what do you seek? And they said, where are you staying? And he said, come and see. Now, this is, again, part of a, a meta narrative. This is the big story. So we've had the, the pre-existent God. We've had the creation of the world. We've had the introduction of the Old Testament and Moses and the law, the covenant. And then we have the forerunner, 
and then we have the Lord Jesus. Now we're going to be introduced to some new thing that was a mystery in the Old Testament, and it's the idea of a church, a tabernacle for God, who's going to be built out of living stones. This is an amazing idea, and that's what we have in this little section. So they say to Jesus, where do you dwell? And he says, come and see. And he invites them to come with him, and they abide with him. And we read that um, Andrew goes and finds his brother Peter and says, we found the Messiah, and uh, he brings him to Jesus, and Jesus says to him, I'm going to call you a stone. And, uh, of course, this is going to be a theme that Peter's going to take up in his epistle. This amazing idea that we are stones. We are going to be living stones built into a, a, a glorious building made up of living material. It will be a living building uh, made up of human beings saved by his grace, uh, broken away from the bedrock of this world and built into a new structure, a habitation of God through the spirit. So this is an amazing idea, and we have a hint of it right here in, in the story of Cephas, of Peter, the stone. And then follows from verse 43 down to 51, a story about two other brothers, uh, Philip and Nathaniel. And Philip, uh, he finds his brother uh, Nathaniel, and uh, he says, uh, we found him of whom Moses, this is verse 45, who Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And, um, and Nathaniel says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, it's important to notice that the Lord Jesus later says, an Israelite in whom is no guile. In other words, Nathaniel's not jaundiced and critical and cynical. He's, he's a guileless person. But he's amazed that Nazareth would be the place where God uh, had placed his Messiah. And so um, the answer, again, is come and see. Come and see. This is our message to the world, isn't it? That when people say, well, I'm not so sure, sure that Jesus saves. I'm not so sure that he's the Messiah. Well, come and see. Come and see. Look into the word of God. Look at the prophecies of the Old Testament. Look at their fulfillment in the New Testament. Come and see. The evidence is there for us to look at. And so Nathaniel, um, he comes to the Lord and the Lord says, Behold, an Israelite in whom is no guile or deceit. Now, what's interesting about this, of course, is that we're going back to the story of Jacob. And we're thinking about a man who was full of guile, right? Jacob was a trickster. Uh, and that he's the one who gets the new name, Israel, a prince with God. And uh, by the end of the chapter, we're with Jacob at Bethel, aren't we? Where he says, uh, the Lord says to him, most assuredly, I say to you hereafter, you'll see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So we're back at Bethel and here's Jacob. And, and the, he sees this image of this, this vision of this ladder that goes to heaven, the angels ascending and descending. Notice the order. In other words, the angels are here among us, and they're going up to God with our needs and bringing back God's provision. They're ministering spirits. And, and the ladder, which we don't hear about back then, we discover in John chapter 1, the ladder is Jesus. He is the link, the mediator between God and man. He is the, he is the connection. And the, and the Lord Jesus introduces himself to Nathaniel as Jacob's ladder, as the link between heaven and earth. And uh, Nathaniel makes this amazing statement, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. These are the two uh, stumbling blocks to the Jewish nation. The deity of Christ, you are the son of God, and the messiahship, the true right of Jesus to sit on the throne of David. Those are the two big issues. And Nathaniel, by revelation, sees these truths, and he makes this confession. Now, I just want to point out a couple of other things from the chapter that I found very 
encouraging. Notice in verse 33, um, John says, uh, I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. All right, so the evidence that, as we read in verse 34, that this is the Son of God. In other words, the evidence that God has come to earth as a man was the descent of the Holy Spirit at the baptism of Jesus. If we go over to chapter 7 and verse 39, we read, but this he spoke in, in other words, in verse 38, he says, he who believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, this is an amazing connection. The idea is we know that God has come to earth as a real man. Because the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus and stayed upon him at his baptism. The descent of the Spirit is the evidence of the incarnation that God has come to dwell as a man among men. Then we go over to Acts chapter 2. And we see that the descent of the Holy Spirit and his abiding on the disciples is the evidence that a real man is now seated on the throne of God. <laughs> so these are the two really big ideas in the Bible. That God has become a man and lived among us. This is a visited planet. People could look eye to eye into the face of God incarnate. And then to think that humanity has been taken to the highest place in the universe and a real man sits on the throne of God. And what's the evidence? The evidence of the first is the descent of the Holy Spirit. And the evidence of the second is the descent of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit coming on the Lord Jesus. We understand that. That's the, the perfect spot that the, that the dove can land. But then the Holy Spirit coming down on the church and coming down on individual believers because we have been sanctified by the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit has come not only to reside on us, but to live in us and to evidence the fact that Christ himself is now glorified and at the right hand of the Father. So that's an astounding truth. It ought to blow our minds to think about that. Um, and, and then, of course, these two come and see statements, right? Jesus says to, to the disciples, come and see. Now, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to tell you a story at the end. Um, when I was living in Michigan, a friend of mine, Anil, uh, was working among the Hindus in Michigan. And for a whole year, he had been coming up to a place called Ganges, Michigan. And he had been befriending the director of a Hindu monastery there. And this monastery had been a place for Hindu evangelism. The first missionary to Hindus to America came to the Chicago World's Fair in 1901 and propagated Hinduism. And this monastery was named after him. And so my friend Anil thought, if these people are interested in evangelism, I am too, I ought to get to know them. And so he had befriended this old director and helped him with his garden and so on. And then after a year, he believed now is the time to go and ask this old man for a Bible study. And so he called me up and said, can you join me? And I drove from Grand Rapids down to Ganges. By the time I got there, the old man had agreed to have a Bible study with Anil and me. We sat on the floor. Anil did a few things first that are uh, sort of familiar to Hindus. Uh, he had translated some of the names of Jesus into Sanskrit which is the Hindu's holy language, and he had repeated these names and explained them. And then he said, as I was driving down the road, I asked the Lord, what passage of scripture should I read and which, what should we think about? And he said, God laid on my heart these words. And so he only read from verse 35 down to um, verse 39. And I thought, well, that was kind of strange. Behold the Lamb of God, Two disciples follow Jesus, 
they say, where are you staying? He says, come and see. And, uh, and they went with him. And that was it. But here was his comment. I take it from these verses that even if you're the disciple of a different way, it's okay to go and learn from Jesus. And then he said, um, if somebody asks us, where do you live? If you don't trust them, you just tell them the town you live in. But if you know them, trust them, you maybe give your street address. And once in a while, you actually invite them to come home and live with you or to stay at your place. And this is what Jesus does. He wants to be friends with us. In fact, said Anil, Jesus took an address down here on earth so that someday we could share an address with him in heaven. That's all he said. Well, as soon as he was finished, this old man turned to me and began to explain reincarnation to me. And I just listened. And when I was, he was finished, I didn't trust myself to say anything. I turned to Anil and said, Anil, what do you think of that? And I'll never forget, Anil turned. He was just beaming love on that old Hindu. And he said to the old man, do you know what I hear? You don't want it to end at death, do you? You want to live beyond death. But you don't want to live in the same state you're in now. You want to live in an improved state. Well, he said, you know, it's not automatic. Only one person in the universe has everlasting life. And then using his hands like this, he said, but if we could interface with him, he could give us everlasting life. And then we could live forever, not in an improved state, but in a perfected state. The old man turned to me and he said, you know, just last week I prayed to God and I asked him to send me someone to teach me about Christianity. And I think this man is the answer to my prayer. You know, you could have scraped me up off the ground with a shovel. If I'd made a list of all the people I thought would be interested in America, interested in the gospel, he wouldn't even be on the list. The harvest doesn't always look like the harvest. And that old Hindu man, no doubt through the friendship of Anil for the last year, had grown to appreciate who Jesus was because he saw Jesus in Anil and he wanted to know more. I tell you, it's such an amazing thing. This is the whole idea here. Jesus befriends us, brings us into intimacy with him. We come to know him and then he sends us out to show other people how wonderful he is. And through this, we make friends for Jesus. So just a few thoughts from this little section. Our time is up. But may the Lord encourage you and bless you as you study this passage and begin to see the connections. And it doesn't stop here. Because now we go into chapter 2 and the very first words we read and the third day. And so when we read the third day, we're going to have to ask, oh, wait a minute, what's the second day? And what's the first day? <laughs> and then we see that the Spirit of God through John has linked the next story, which talks about a marriage. And a, and a celebration as the climax to this whole series. No surprise that that's how history ends, with a marriage and a marriage celebration in the world to come. So just a little hint there as we follow through in the Gospel of John. So the Lord bless you in your study. This is a thrilling book. It's full of beautiful portraits of Christ, and it's all about seeing him, beholding him, following him, fellowshipping with him. It's all about intimacy with the Lord Jesus. So may God bless you in your study, and, uh, and I'll leave you now. Thank you.